Well, I said that uh, in the very beginning, I thought that, I, you know, I just have walked by faith all these years, but I do ask people to pray for me. And I wish that you'd pray for a couple things that I'm involved in right now. And I uh, think about that old man up there, 88 years in that church. I've been going to church for 86 years. Mm -hmm. Not the same church, but uh, uh, that's a long time, isn't it? Amen. Yeah. The only good thing about being old is you didn't die young, amen? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, so, but I want you to pray for a, a couple things. I appreciate all your help that you've been giving me as a church here. And uh, I just want you to know that we use every dime that comes into us for the ministry. We don't, Lois and I don't, uh, we're just farm people. And so we can get along. You know, I grew up taking a bath in a creek. You ever do that? <laughs> that good, good uh, fresh water makes you feel better than any other kind of bath. But uh, so we've been able to get along all these years and uh, with a lot less than what most people demand. And so we've been able to put all of it in the ministry. And I want you to pray for us about our Pakistani work. We've got three churches that we're working with over there. One church is a, is a, a product of a young man that emailed a businessman in, in New York City and said, I want to know what the Christians believe. And he started with him on the, on the internet, and then got on the Skype, led him to the Lord. And after I don't know how many years it was, he trained him in every way in the Bible doctrine and uh, and in the Baptist uh, policies and uh, he uh, so they said well we're going to Bangladesh we'll meet you there and they went over to Bangladesh and baptized him and sent him back to Pakistan and he said I want to start a church like your your church mm -hmm. and so he did start a church and they ordained him he's a graduate of college over there and his wife has a master's degree in English so it really works, and his his uh, his brother-in-law also have a master's degree, and and so we're able to do a lot through him to reach people in the Urdu language, and uh, we hope that you'll pray for us. We're building a Bible college right now. God gave us the money for the land, and uh, uh, I think we got cheated on the land, but it was land, and we had to have it right next to the church. And uh, with all the persecution and the violence that's going on over there, that was important to us. And then we're building the building now. And so I need about $10,000 for brick. They make their own bricks and lay them themselves. And we're going to build a three-story building. Uh, the bottom floor is going to be the Bible Institute. The next door is going to be an orphanage. Mm -hmm. A lot of little kids over there that are starving to death and... Uh, we get them in and tell them we love them and feed them and they believe that and train them. And we're hoping that that new generation will do more for God than we've ever done. And then uh, on the top floor, we're going to have up there a, a program of uh, helping and feeding uh, hungry people. And so I hope that you'll pray about that. And then we're working with a gypsy church in Pakistan. And we're trying to get a building for that. And so we hope that you'll bring a lot of gypsies there. And so uh, we have this uh, uh, gypsy preacher from Cleveland Baptist Church, Brother Stevens, and I are working together on that. And so we pray for that, if you would please. And don't just say, dear God, bless Pakistan. I mean, if you don't mind, pray in particular about each one of these things. And then we have another church that we're working with and getting started over there. All these are Pakistanis, no American missionaries. All of them are Pakistanis, and we're training them and working with them, and we just believe that good things are going to happen in that strong, closed Muslim nation, and uh, we need that. We uh, we've got the Bible, and uh, we've got Bibles and tracts and Urdu now, and and Bible Institute material that these people have translated, and we're going to be able to do really a good work for the Lord there. Don't just say, dear God, bless Brother Clayton in Pakistan. I mean, I hope that you'll pray 
in particular about these three churches. All right, if you have your Bible, turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 3 this morning. 2 Peter chapter 3. I do want to say that I thank God that uh, he has kept Lois and I safe through all this virus. I may have had it when I was out in, uh, in uh, Seattle. When it first hit, we were in Seattle. And I got very, very sick. It didn't last long. I've got a good immune system, it seems. And uh, uh, it didn't last like it lasts for a lot of people. But I, I, I got COPD, and that's a problem. And then I got COVID, and that's a problem, or was a problem. Now sitting around the house, I got another condition. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. It's L-A-Z-Y. <laughs> and so, uh, but keep us in your prayers. I know that some of you pray for us every day. Amen. And we're so thankful for that indeed. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. You follow me as I read out loud to you. Uh, starting with verse number 1, 2 Peter. You know where that is? Just after 1 Peter, right? And just before 1 John, all right? Right in there is this uh, a chapter. You know, I, I just can't say too much about this book. I just love it. Now, Peter, Peter starts it out by saying, Hey, I want you to remember, I'm getting old and I'm going to die. And that's in chapter 1. And he said, I want you to remember me, and this is the way I want you to remember me. I want you to remember that I didn't follow any devised coming fables. He said, I want you to remember me as one who heard the Lord preach and heard the Lord speak and heard God out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son. I heard something. And then I want you to remember me as someone that saw something. I saw Jesus. Transfigured right before my eyes. Well, Peter heard and saw something, didn't he? Amen. Now he comes along in this chapter 3 and verse number 1. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Again, he's talking about memory. Now, I've got a good memory. I just don't remember where I put it. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of like the old boy that uh, was sitting in his easy chair and he thought to thinking about something out in the garage that he needed to do. So he went out in the garage, by the time he got there, he'd forgotten it. So he went back and sat down in his easy chair, there it came up again. And any of you know how that works? <laughs> and uh, oh, boom, there it is, you know. And, he went out in the garage and forgot it again. So he just went back in the house, picked up his easy chair, and put it out in the garage. <laughs> so uh, the trip, you know, from the chair to the garage, that's a long, hard trip. And uh, God will forgive every kind of thing. But he says, I want you to remember something. And this is what I want you to remember in this particular part of this book, verse 2. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now they ask the question, these scoffers, in the last day. Well, we've got scoffers today, amen? amen. And uh, these scoffers are going to ask the question, where is the promise of his coming? Well, now they didn't want to know the answer to that. They were scoffers. Sorry. I don't like to ask somebody to ask me a question that they don't want me to answer. <laughs> what they did was they asked the question and they post it with a lie. Hmm. Which says, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And that's not true. That's right. Everything changes. Amen? Amen. If you don't believe it, 
You look at your graduation picture, then you look in the mirror. <laughs> and you'll find out that you've done some changing. Amen. <laughs> All right, he said these coffers will ask this question. Well, let's read on some more of these verses. That's fabulous here. In verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of. They just are ignorant, and they admit it. I mean, uh, I guess the most ignorant person in the world is ignorant. a person that's ignorant don't know it. Yeah. But these guys, they, they ask this question knowing that it wasn't going to be answered. I, I, as I said, I don't like that kind of a question. I don't mind any question, anytime, anywhere, but the person I want to ask the question, I want them to really mean it. I worked in Copeland Refrigeration Company when I was going to Bible College, and they put me in charge of the whole warehouse, and there was other guys there that had been there a long time, and they were upset with me being kind of the boss, and, and uh, they, uh, they, they knew my testimony, knew I was a preacher, and they got together one time and said, Let, let's embarrass him. So they thought, we'll ask him a question he can't answer. <laughs> the question was, can my God make a rock so big he can't carry it? You ever hear that? Mm. How dumb is that? <laughs> <laughs> if you say yes, it means he can make the rock, but he can't carry it. God can't do everything. <laughs> if you say no, he can carry any rock, it means God couldn't make a rock that day. Boy, they thought they had me, you know. Can God make a rock so big he can't carry it? I said, sure he can. He made your head, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. This guy, these people don't want to know the answer, but God gives the answer. For this they are well in the ignorant of, in verse 6, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved under the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. There it is. You've been looking for that verse. There it is. Verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long suffering to usward that uh, not, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. I love that portion of Scripture. God here gives an answer to the question. Where is the promise of His, sons, of his coming? I'd like to make an effort to answer that this morning if I could. And the first point of my sermon is this. The answer to that question is found in the question itself. <laughs> Where is the promise of his coming? I like that word promise. I love a promise, a good promise. I think a promise uh, should be kept, that's made. Some people say, well, a promise is made to be broken. No, no, I don't think so. And God gives us some promises. It's found, the answer is found right in that promise. Jesus said, if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again Amen. and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, in John chapter 14. That's a promise. The promise of the Lord is that he's going to come again. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I look forward to that. Amen. The Bible says that when he comes, we're going to get a brand new body. Amen. Boy, 
I'm going to pick a nice thin one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Handsome, with a great voice. You get to heaven, you hear this music, and you say, who in the world is singing that? And somebody says, Larry Clayton over there. <laughs> wow. I look forward to the wonderful thing of his coming. I'm anxious for his coming. It really is the only answer we have to all the problems that humanity faces today. The promise of his coming. He told us he'd come again. Oh, I know there's a lot of promises that have been made that have been broken. A lot of people have said things that were not true. But when it comes to the second coming of God and the promise of the Holy Spirit of God upon us through the Word of God, we know that Jesus is going to come again. Amen. Amen. Oh, that would be a great day, huh? Amen. He'll set things in order. He'll take over this world eventually. Let me tell you how it's going to be, okay? I really didn't intend to get this in here, but I want to put it in there for you. The Lord's going to come with a trumpet sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain to the coming will meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. From now on, after that, we're going to be wherever Jesus goes, we're going to be with him. Amen. Boy, that's great, huh? Amen. Amen. And when, I, when he comes, he's going to bring our loved ones with him. We're going to meet him in the air. And we're going to be with him. Boy, what a wonderful thought that is. Amen. Amen. Jesus is coming again. And when he takes us out of here, he's going to take us up into heaven for seven years. Mm -hmm. And uh, while the world is going through the great tribulation, you know, you read the Bible in the book of Revelation and you'll see there's many holocausts coming. And while the world is going through the holocaust, we're going to be up in heaven with our loved ones and with Jesus, and the Lord is going to be passing out rewards. Boy. I love to be able to get gifts, don't you? Boy. My birthday is September 26th. Send me a big, big birthday present. <laughs> I'll love you for it. I like to get gifts. Uh, I got to, we go to preach, we go to places and preach, and, and uh, so oftentimes the church will have a gift basket for us. After we're in a motel, we'll be sitting on the desk when we go in, and it's usually full of fruits and everything else. Boy, did Lois and I get a gift basket yesterday. <laughs> you know, Phil, he knows what that gift basket's all about. So he filled it full of chocolate candy. <laughs> Anybody in here like chocolate candy? Yeah. Oh, man. Everybody. That's a Baptist thing, amen? <laughs> chocolate covered peanuts. You know, candy's got the best in the whole wide world, and I'm taking time here talking about this, but it was a real blessing. <laughs> and uh, the Lord, when we go up into heaven for seven years, the Lord is going to pass out rewards to the faithful. Yes, well now, the church can give a nice gift, Pastor. What do you think God can give? Amen. As rewards. Amen. That blows my mind. I don't know about you, but it really, he's the God on the mountain. And he's got in the valley. Dottie Rambo's beautiful old song. She wrote about 2,000 of them. Mm -hmm. She wrote some of my very favorites, and that's one of them. Mm -hmm. Boy, he, he is the God on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And he's going to pass out rewards for seven years. And after that seven years is over, the Lord is going to come back to this earth. And we're going to come with him. What a trip that'll be, huh? <clears throat> Man, I'm getting ready for that right now. Are you? No. Boy, I, I, want, I want my rewards. Uh, you earn them all right here. That's another sermon. Well, the Lord's going to come. And, you know, where is the promise of His coming? It's in His promise. Behold, He come with clouds, 
and every eye shall see him. Revelation chapter 1. He said he's going to come again in Revelation, the last chapter of the book of Revelation. It's filled full of all the prophecies that's going to take place here in the future. Wow. Chapter 4 says, and after this I saw, John saw. Lois and I have lost a lot of loved ones this year. Been probably the most we've ever seen. And we've got some now just on the edge, the very edge of passing away that we're praying for. Some of our family members, my nephew, that I had a, really had a little part in raising, died this week. Young man, I mean, young compared to me, of course, most everything is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing to face death. Boy, it's a wonderful have to have the promise of eternal life in heaven forever. I told a woman here while back in a, in a, uh, Costa Rica, San Juan Pope, Costa Rica. I went in to get some suits cleaned for the big special day we're going to have dedicating the church. And uh, I went in happy and she said, oh, you're so happy today. I said, I should be. I've been born twice and I'll never die but once. You know what that gives me? She said, what's that? I said, eternal life. <laughs> Amen. Never will I have to worry about dying. For the king rules on the other side of Jordan over in the holy land of heaven. Hmm. Wow. It's in his promise. If I go away, I'm going to come again. Amen. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. Right in the promise. Where is the promise of his coming? Well, secondly, we find the promise of his coming in the very near future. He says that one year is with a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand to, a, to one. You know, the Lord's been away two thousand years. And this world is about ready to go into its 7,000th year. Mm -hmm. And that's a year of rest. Mm. Boy, he's going to come and get us. We're going to be going. We're, he's going to take us to a place of rest. Yes, I believe that's going to happen. Where mm. is the promise of his coming? I believe it's in the very near future. Mm. I believe we're in the wind-up years right now. Amen. Amen. We can see that, can we not? Looking at this world and the trouble this world has. Amen. And you know, uh, my wife and I have been together 80 mission fields. That's counting all the mission fields. Some countries, more than one. We've been in and I've preached in 80 mission fields. And we've seen the problems of this old world. And I'll tell you, it's, it's going to be something. One girl told me yesterday on the phone, I know it's going to be, uh, I, I know we're in trouble and I know the world's in trouble, but it'll be exciting. I told Lois, I said, what's coming is not going to be exciting, I'll tell you that much. It's not, you know the Bible says it's going to wax worse and worse? It's not going to get any better. Yeah, yeah, I believe that the Lord's coming is in the near future. I really don't believe that I'm going to have to go down to the valley of the shadow of death. I believe I'm going to be here when the trumpet sounds and the Lord says, come up hither. And we rise up to meet him in the air. Oh, what a glorious time that's going to be. You want to know what they're doing up in heaven right now? Just read the book of Revelation and see what John saw when he got there. And you'll see what our loved ones are seeing in heaven today. Boy, it's better than anything the world has ever been able to produce. Greater than anything Disney ever dreamed. Amen. We're going to see the Lord himself face to face. What a glorious time. Yes, I believe he's coming. 
I believe that the promise that is coming is in the very near future. And then lastly, I believe he's going to come and the promise of his coming is found in the constant conversation and the anticipation of the best people on earth, God's people. Yes, we anticipate that, don't we? I mean, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. I, I anticipate that. I, my hope, my hope of the future is when Jesus comes and reigns. Now, when he comes back the next time, as I told you, he's going to come back to Jerusalem, and he's going to set up his kingdom, and he's going to rule on the Mount of Olives for a thousand years. Amen. He's going to rule. The Democrats and the Republicans are not going to be in charge. Amen. Amen. Jesus is in charge. Amen. 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 Someone said, Brother well, Clinton, what politics are you? And I said, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> Amen. Not a bad twist. A Baptist. A lot of difference. Amen. Amen. But I believe that Jesus is going to come. And when he comes... We're going to see him, and you know what? That's a great, great hope in my heart. Amen. Jesus is going to come. Amen. I find it in the anticipation of the best people on earth. Everybody that knows the Lord and is saved, they're all saying, you know, one of these days, the Lord's going to come. You know, uh, the Jews used to say, next year in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They were always anticipating mm -hmm. going back to Jerusalem mm -hmm. and having their own homeland. And we've seen it happen in our daytime, haven't we? Right. In, our day, in our lifetime, I should say. We've seen it happen. Wow. Yes, it's in the greatest anticipation of the best people on this side of the whole world. When it comes, we're going to see our loved ones again. Amen. Wow. I was preaching in Clarksville, Tennessee, near that big uh, uh, air base down there, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, there was a man in the church, we call him Sarge. He, uh, he was the kind of guy that trained the 101st Airborne Division. Hmm. I had a brother in that. I led some people to Christ in that division. Great, great division in the United States military. He was a tough guy. And he'd take these new recruits up those Tennessee mountains, <coughs> fully packed with a gun on their back, and he'd go out in front of them and he'd make it to the top and... and <laughs> Really was a tough dude, I'll tell you. And he was a, a tough trainer. They called him Sarge. <laughs> and the war was going on in Vietnam, and he, he was called up to go over there. And he left his wife and little boy in Clarksville. Phil remembered that we had several revivals in Clarksville. And, uh, and one of them was after he had gone over, and after one of the services, the preacher said to me, he said, Brother Clayton, I'd like for you to come and go with my wife and I out to Sarge's house. His wife had some things he sent from Vietnam that Sarge thought maybe you'd like to see. So we went over there, we were looking at the items, tea set and all of the various beautiful things that he was able to purchase and send back. And they had a little boy, and that little boy came up to me and said, Brother Clayton, I want to show you my daddy. And he took my little finger, and he took me into his bedroom. And there on the side of his bed was a picture of his daddy. He said, that's my daddy. I looked at it, and I could see some smudges where he'd been kissing that picture. Maybe a little gravy on his lips or something. It, it was there. And he said, uh, that's my daddy. I said, oh, yes. 
I know your daddy and I love him and he's a great guy. And I said, you know, <laughs> you and mama went out to say goodbye at the airport when he got on that big military plane and flew away. I said, one of these days, your mama's going to take you back out there and daddy's going to come home and you're going to, and he's going to get that old foot out of that airplane and he's going to hug you and kiss you. He's going to set you on his lap. He's going to be home. Oh, he said, Brother Clayton, that's wonderful. I went back into the table where everybody was. The little boy kind of followed me back. And I told the mother what he had said. Oh, she said, yes, Brother Clayton. The other night after you preached on heaven, said we came home and he fell asleep in, on my lap in the front seat of the car. And said when we got home, I carried him in and set him on the bed. And he said he looked over that picture and said, Daddy, my Daddy, how I wish you could step out of that picture and come and kiss me goodnight and hear my prayer and tuck the covers around my neck. Boy, I thought that kind of illustrates to me the anticipation and the hope in our heart. We look at the sky like a picture. And we can say, oh Lord, we'd like for you to step out of that picture and come down here and pull us up to your heart and kiss away our tears and wipe away the stains and take us, take us to where we'll be with you forever. Boy. Amen. I was thanking song leader for uh, D.L. Moody years ago. <clears throat> He was a song leader and he played on a little pump organ on them big meetings they had and sang, had a beautiful solo voice. And after Mr. Moody died, Iris Sankey started getting old and he went blind. And a preacher friend of his came to see him one time in his home in Pennsylvania. The preacher said to him, Brother Sankey, I'm going to have to go home before dark. I've got a team of horses out there and I don't want to go home in the dark with them. So I'll, I'll have to leave you, but I want you to sing me something before I go. He said, well, help me to the organ. Got him over the organ and he started pumping it and playing it. He said, what do you want me to sing? He said, well, sing everything. So he started playing. There'll be no dark valleys when Jesus comes. There'll be no dark valleys when Jesus comes. There'll be no dark valleys when Jesus comes to carry our loved ones home. Mm. To carry our loved ones home. To carry our loved ones To carry our loved ones home. There'll be songs and singing when Jesus comes. There'll be joyful meetings when Jesus comes. There'll be wonderful greetings when Jesus comes. To carry his loved ones home. To carry his loved ones home. To carry his loved ones home. There'll be 